as so many of you know, we are in a series, or we've been in a series entitled The Other Side. And in fact, if you're with us last week, maybe this is the first week you've been with us, we, we kind of took a little bit of a hiatus from that series to just look at and to celebrate all that God has done in the 15 year anniversary of this church, how God is using us, what God is doing in us, how he wants to use us. But we're back at this series today, uh, and we've covered a lot of territory. We, we talked about loving the lonely. We've talked about empowering the poor. Today, I want to talk to you about this theme, something that I think is very near and dear or should be very near and dear to our hearts. We're going to talk about embracing orphans, embracing the orphans. Here, here's what I discovered this week that was rather astonishing, maybe even a little overwhelming to me. I learned that in our country alone, the United States alone, there are somewhere around 400,000 children that we could consider orphans, don't have families, don't have homes. Now, when, when I heard that or I discovered that, as I said, it was overwhelming. It was astonishing to me that that could be the case in our part of the world. I don't even know what the number is for the totality of the world. But then immediately, I felt like God speak to my heart this thought. While that is the reality, there are hundreds of more followers of Christ. There, there's more believers, more followers of Christ, more people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ in our country than there are these orphans, right? And so what I want to do today is this. I, I, I'm going to preface this by saying this is not a guilt trip. Just turn to your neighbor and say it's not a guilt trip, okay? It, it's, not, it's not a high-pressure sales pitch, okay? I'm not trying to guilt you into something, but I do want you to see today, I want all of us to recognize that God's plan A has always been and arguably always will be to use the church. You know who that is. We're the church, right? This is the church. This is the steeple. Look inside. See all the people, right? We, we are the church, and it has always been God's plan to use us, his followers, those of us who have been introduced to the life-changing message of Jesus Christ and have been transformed by his power, the broken pieces of our lives put back together again to be a witness and a testimony to the world that there is hope. Can we get an amen on that? There is hope. There, there is joy. There is peace. There is newness of life, and it is not a concept. It is not a theory. It is not an idea. It is and always will be the person. That is Jesus Christ, and when you come to know him, your life will forever be changed. So God's plan has always been, plan A, to use the church to meet the needs of those who are in need. In fact, Scripture talks about it like this. If you have your Bibles or you're following along version Live or in your talk notes or on the screens, we're a multifaceted church. We got you covered. James 1.27 says this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Translation. James is essentially saying this. You want to know what makes God happy? You want to know what pleases God? You want to know how to honor God with your life? You want to know how to put a smile on the Almighty? right? Here's what you do. Care for widows, care for orphans, and keep yourself separated from the things that could pollute your life. Now, here's what I think about that, especially if you have come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The gospel has transformed your life. I think we get that, right? I think it's kind of part of our spiritual rebirth, right? Part of our, our new spiritual DNA as, as we have been brought into the family of God. We, we get that, right? In fact, I think arguably, if I said to you, let me show you some pictures of some of the orphans in our world, and I put their pictures on the screen. I won't because I don't have any. But, but if I, I showed you their pictures and told you their names and told you their stories, I think most of us, if not all of us, would say, how can I help? L let me liberate you to go ahead and talk back to me today. You can say amen. You can say yes, okay? It's going to be much more interesting if you help. All right? But, but, but I think most of us would say, how can I get involved? How can I help? How can I serve? What can I do? Why? Be because we would see their faces and we would know their names and we would know their stories. But you know what the reality is? Of those 400,000 kids in our country, all of them still have faces. They all still have names. 
They all have, they still have stories and God cares for each and every one of them. And he's calling us as his people to care as well. In fact, in my notes, I, I, I jotted down some, some thoughts in regards to some of the problems that I would argue we're facing in our world today in relation to families, in relation to society. And, and I want to read some of these for you, just a short list. But, but I want you to think about this question. Who pays the highest price for these problems? Here's some of them. Broken families, fatherlessness, divorce, poverty, substance abuse, incarceration, homelessness, domestic abuse, gang violence, racism, teenage pregnancy, human trafficking. The, the, the list could go on and on and on and on and on, but we probably already know the answer to the question, who pays the highest price? Help me out. Kids, Kids the children, right? The ones who haven't caused the problem. The ones who don't have the ability or the solutions to the problem are the ones that pay the highest price for the problem. Which is why I think God had David write these words in Psalm 82, beginning in verse 3, says this, Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Again, I think when we see needs, we, we say we want to respond to that. I think arguably most of us, if not all of us, would say, I, I want to defend the fatherless. Where's my men at? You want to defend the fatherless, right? We, we want to protect the weak. We, we, we want to rescue those who are needy or who are poor, right? I think all of us want to do that. And yet, in reality, how we maybe live out our lives, if we're honest, and, and I'm just going to raise my hand and say, I'm there with you. Because you know how it works. I'm not pointing fingers at you because if I point fingers at you, there's three pointing back at me, right? But we, we know these problems exist and we want to do something about it. But so often we can kind of live our lives out of sight, out of mind. We, we can be so consumed with our own lives and our own agendas and our own plans and, and our own children and our own debt and all this kind of stuff that we can often overlook or maybe not be sensitive to or pay attention to the needs that are right around us. And yet again, God cares for these individuals that are in need more than we could ever imagine. And he's calling us to care as well. David goes on to say this in Psalm 68, beginning in verse 5. He's describing God. He says, a father, God is a father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. Check this out though. This, this thought kind of changed some of my thinking this week. He says, God sets the lonely in families. Th think about that. God sets the lonely in families. Essentially what he's saying is this. When you have maybe some of the orphans of our world that are, are crying out, God, I'm lonely. God, I don't have a home. I, I don't have a family. That, that what we glean from this passage is that God is working aggressively. He's working attentively. He's working passionately to say, how can I take the lonely and put them into a family? Why? Because God wants everyone to know love. Can I get an amen on that? He wants them to experience compassion, right? He, he wants them to be exposed to the gospel and the grace that is available to them through Jesus Christ. That's why he's called us, the church, to be his witnesses. That's why he's called us, the church, to be his light. Because he wants to use us, those of us who've been redeemed and transformed and changed by the power of the living God, to be an example and to expose others to the gospel and the hope that is available to them through Jesus Christ. I talked about it in the first service. I'll just do it again. It's kind of like our our Sunday school times. Anybody remember Sunday school? Have you, are, you, are you that kind of church person? Remember Sunday school? Remember the little song we used to sing? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Come on, help me out. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's the high part. I don't sing high parts. <laughs> right? But this is what God has called us to do. 
And, and what we see in this text is that he is aggressively trying to take those who feel lonely, who fail familyless, and put them into families. Which then brought me to thinking this. And I'm going to kind of put this on you because I already kind of talked to myself about this this week. But what if God has his eye on your family? What if God is saying, I want to use you to answer the deepest prayer of one of these who feels lonely? Who feels lonely? Who doesn't have a family? What if God wants to use your family to make that difference in someone's life? Because here, here's what I want you to understand. So many people will say, but I, I don't have the ability. Listen to me. God is not looking for ability. He's simply looking for availability. If you're a Facebook or a Twitter person, you want to tweet, there you go. Right? He, 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 never, he never calls the qualified. I'll give you a few more as we go through the day, okay? He, he never calls the qualified. He qualifies the called. What we see over and over and over again in scripture is that what God calls you to do, he will enable you and empower you and equip you to do. All he's asking for is not ability just for you to say, I'll be willing to do whatever you want me to do at whatever level you want me to do it because I know that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. And I think it's interesting to, to try to wrap our mind around it. I don't know if we could fully wrap our mind around it, but I, I think it's interesting to think about what could happen in our world. What could happen in our sphere of influence if we as church people didn't just go to church, wasn't just some sort of religious obligation or duty, but we actually were the church? What kind of impact could we have if we literally became the hands and the feet of Jesus into the most troublesome, most difficult areas of our life or of our world. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. And and please, let me qualify this by saying this is not any recognition upon me or my family. I I really want you to see how cool God is. But but if, if, if you know us or you've been part of our church, you know that Carrie and I did foster care for many, many years. And if I had to think about like the success stories of, a, of our foster care experience. Probably one of the greatest success story was when we had the opportunity to take Daquan and Maria into our house. Some of you remember Daquan and Maria, right? And, and, and basically their story, just give you a quick version, okay? Their, their mom, uh, good lady, loved her kids, just didn't have the ability to, to raise them. And the, the state stepped in and said, hey, listen, we're gonna have to pull them out of the home. And they placed Daquan and Maria into our home. And if you know anything about foster care, it's kind of funny. It, it was supposed to be kind of a short-term thing, but it usually never is. It, it, it's kind of much longer, and it became a much longer thing until it actually developed to the point where they said, hey, listen, Daquan and Maria are, are not going to be able to go home with mom, so we're going to move them into adoption. We're going to take them out of the foster care field and put them into the adoption field. And so they immediately said, hey, do you guys want to adopt them? And immediately I said to the caseworker, what are you doing to me, bro? Like, how do you put me on the spot like that? No, I didn't say that, but I felt that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, what we had said to them was this. We said, we're going to pray about it, and we prayed about it, but we really felt, Carrie and I really felt called to the foster end of things because we felt like we wanted to be kind of the intermediate home when kids were pulled out of their homes for whatever reason, maybe didn't really understand, and the reality is we as adults might understand, but kids often don't. We wanted to be that safe environment that they could come to, they could find love, but we really enjoyed the component of trying to help them get reunified with their parents if that was what the case was going to be or help them find their forever home. And so we said, listen, we're going to stick with fostering. We're not going to do the adoption end. And so they said, okay. They said, well, then do you know anyone that, that would be interested in adop- adopting Daquan and Maria? And we said, hey, can you, like, if you'll let us, we could kind of, you know, God has allowed us to be pastors of a church. We hear lots of stories and we know lots of couples that can have kids. Can, can we help out? And the case was like, do your thing. And I said, you shouldn't tell me to do my thing because I'll do my thing. <laughs> and so we, we, we said, hey, we know a couple. And, and some of you know this couple, Danny and Heather, were a part of this church for a very long time. They were actually our children's pastors for many years. And then they felt called by God to go and start their own church. And so they had transitioned out of Ridgewood and they were serving in their own church. And we called up Danny and Heather and said, hey, you guys, you know Daquan and Maria. 
you, you've been their children's pastors. You know, you come over to the house and they, they've interacted and, you know, it's kind of like this family environment. So we said, would you be interested in, in, in adopting Daquan and Maria? Well, at that time, they were actually in the process of adopting their first daughter named Faith. And so the agency said, we don't want two adoptions happening at the exact same time. So why don't we just move Daquan and Maria in as foster kids? Let's finalize the first adoption and then we'll move into the adoption of the other one. So that's what we did. And, and here, I've got to make this story short because I'm going over my time. But he, he, here's what happened. God did this amazing thing where he orchestrated this fact that there were some kids, three of them in particular for this family, that were lonely, that didn't have homes, that didn't have families, or they didn't have families that could care for them. And they took a family that was unable to have children. And now this family has three beautiful children because this is what can happen when the church doesn't just go to church, but they actually are the church. Th this is what happens, right? It's awesome. Give praise to God. But, but I want to show you another thought that, that comes in line with that. Because as I was thinking about that this week, here's the thought that occurred to me. As much and as, ma as amazing as that story is and how God orchestrates and, and, and brings the lonely into families, it's also in many ways a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because here's what we have to understand. All of us, you, me, every living human being, we were at one time spiritual orphans, separated from God because of our sins. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's intended desire for us. That's why it was necessary for God to send God, God to send Jesus to come to this earth to do for us what we could never have done for ourselves. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins and mine. He was buried in a grave. And on the third day, he rose again, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave. All so he could offer us new life in him. And the Bible says that anyone that places their faith in Jesus Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Our sins are erased. They're eradicated. It's as, it's as if it never even happened. All because of the grace and the mercy and the love of God. But don't miss the totality of the picture. All of that happened so that God could adopt us spiritual orphans into his family. You see the connection? He, he said, I, I adopt you in, which means this. When you call on the name of Jesus, you take on his name. You're never alone. You're never by yourself. You are brought into the family of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator and sustainer of all things, says, that's my boy, that's my girl, that's my child. He doesn't look at what you did. He doesn't look at what you haven't done because the reality is there's nothing you can do to get him to love you more. There is nothing that you can do to cause him to love you less. He grafts you in. He adopts you into his family, not because you're good enough, not because you deserve it. Why? Because the Bible says God delights. God rejoices. God celebrates. He delights in adopting people into his family. Check this out. This, this is so amazing to me. The Apostle Paul talks about it like this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. L listen to this. I love this. God decided in advance. J j some, some of you aren't getting this. Just turn to your neighbor and say, in advance. What does that mean? Before you wanted anything to do with him. Before you moved in his direction. Be before you ever had an encounter with him. God decided in advance to what? To adopt us into his own family by bringing us to him through Jesus Christ. So again, it's not by your works, not by your efforts. It's simply by what Jesus has done for you. But watch the last part. This is what God wanted to do. He wasn't coerced. He wasn't manipulated. He wasn't forced. He wanted to do it. And it gave him great pleasure. God is smiling about the fact that he can look at you and say, because of me, because of my love, because of what I have done. Come on, son or daughter. Come to daddy. <laughs> that sounds weird. 
But anyway. I will love you. That was really weird. I feel really strange right now. <laughs> if my head really starts sweating. It's a pretty good indication that I just embarrassed myself. <laughs> Woo, time out. <laughs> Woo, okay, where was I? God delights in bringing us into his family. He delights in taking imperfect people and sanctifying them and making them whole and complete in him. Think about the magnitude of what that means for your life. Think about what that really means for you. I know what that means for me. And yet when we think of that and how our response is, because I think in so many ways, when we are reaching out to others, when we are maybe willing to take other people and bring them into our homes, bring them into our sphere of influence, bring them into our spiritual family, that's when we're the most like God. And yet so many times we can go, whoa, 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 but Chris, like if you're talking about like fostering or adopting a kid, I get it. I know it's good and, and, and I appreciate that, but I could never do that. I, I could never do that. Like, and, and the reality is this. I'm just going to tell you, some of you, you're right. You could never do it. Don't do it. Okay. But some of you, you can. And, and I'm just wondering sometimes, maybe before we just say an absolute no, maybe before we say, God, I could never do that. Maybe before we come to a place where we say, Chris, if, if, if I do that and, and they go home, it's going to rip my heart out and, and I'm not going to be able to handle that. Listen to me. If it doesn't rip your heart out, you're not doing it right. Amen. Okay? But maybe before we say absolutely no, we could pause and we could say, God, is this something you're calling me to do? Is this something you're leading me to do? Or are, you, are you prompting me? Are you nudging me to move in this direction? And if he is, maybe we could just simply say yes. I told you I would give you some little lines. I jokingly say, those who resist the most are called the most. I don't know if that's necessarily true in regards to this, but I'm just saying. For whoever that's worth, you just take that home. But maybe we could just say, God, I'm willing for you to use me in whatever capacity at whatever level, in whatever way you want to use me. Maybe we could just say yes, because here's what I want you to understand. When you say yes to God, listen to me, and th this really applies to lots of areas in our life, okay? When you say yes to God, the reality is it will probably be the hardest thing you ever do. God has this unique ability to stretch us beyond what we could ever think, right? It'll probably be the hardest thing you ever do. If we're talking, you bringing someone into your home, like, like a foster child or adopting, here's what you got to understand. I promise you, it will be difficult. I promise you, there will be setbacks. I promise you, you'll have to take out some extra insurance for the things that get broken. <laughs> I, I promise you, if you have biological children of your own, there will be some struggles acclimating the two families together. But here's what I want you to understand. Once you realize that, you will quickly discover that the children are always worth it. In fact, I'm going to quote Pastor Jeff. And I'm going to tell you that I'm quoting Pastor Jeff Leake from Allison Park Church because I don't mess with the Godfather. Okay? But he often says, we're one generation away from extinction. If we don't have a heart and a passion for not just the next generation, but the generation of today, we as the church are one generation away from extinction. So here's what I want you to understand. 
None of us can do everything. But all of us can do something. None of us can do it all. We can't solve all of the world's problems. We can't change everyone's life, but we all can do something. What, what, what are some of the things that we can do? Well, let's talk in regards to orphans or, or foster children. Here, here's what we could do. You, you may not be able to take a kid into your home, but you can be an advocate. You can be a voice for that kid who maybe doesn't have a voice. Not physically, but you know what I'm saying. Right? M maybe you can't bring a, a child into your home but check this out. You could help raise money for ministries that are out there taking care of widows and orphans. Or you can help raise money for people that are adopting children because I'll tell you what, oftentimes it's very expensive. Right? Or, or maybe you could do this. You could become a respite home for foster parents. What does that mean? That means that you could get certified by the state, approved by the state to take kids into your home. So when, when, when those foster parents need just a little bit of a break, I remember when we were, we were foster parents, sometimes we sent our kids and the foster kids just so Carrie and I could have like an hour of conversation that was adult. You know what I mean? But, but you can become a respite home. Or how about this? How about this? You could always help support a single mom who in many ways we could define as the widows of our world. See, here, here's what I want you to understand. Th this is something that matters to the heart of God, and I would argue should definitely matter to us. Here it is. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe that all life matters. What does that mean for us? Well, let me, let me break it down for you, okay? That means that we believe in the life of the unborn child. But we also, and a lot of, well, yeah, that's us, right? But... We also believe in the life of the born child. Which means we also believe in the life of the teenager who has an unexpected pregnancy and, and doesn't know where to turn and is afraid that she's going to be ostracized and, and, and judged and condemned by society. We believe in her life. But we also believe in the life of the mother who maybe has the family and, and has the husband and has the job and has the house but sometimes feels inadequately prepared to take care of the child that God has given them. We believe in all life. All life matters to God and all life should matter to us, which means this, because all life matters to God and because all life should matter to us, then all life deserves not only a physical family, but a spiritual family. Amen. All life deserves it. So here's what I want you to understand. You may not be able to be the physical family, and that's okay. That may not be what God is calling you to do. But we all can be a spiritual family. What does that look like? How about this? You could always put a smile on a kid's face. Some of your faces are just goofy enough to make any kid smile. I'll put myself in that category too. Right? Right? But, but you, can, you can maybe be, I, I love how David put it in scripture, I will become even more undignified in worship of my God. You, you can become a little undignified, if you will, to put a smile on a kid's face if you see them down, right? Or, or how about this? You could be a spiritual family by saying, you know what? I am so passionate about the generation that is and the generation that is to come that they would know the love of the Father like I have come to know the love of the Father that I will serve in Ridge Kids downstairs. Or I will volunteer in the nursery or the preschool. Right? So, some of you, you could say, you know what? I want to be a spiritual family. So you know what you could do? You could throw a baby shower for a family that's adopting a kid. Or you could take it another level and you could say, you know what? There's this, this unreached people group called caseworkers. And you could reach out to the caseworker of some of these kids that are often overworked and underpaid. Or you could just look for average ordinary needs that are happening right in your neighborhood, right in your community, right in your workplace. And you could say, God, give me eyes to see. Give me a heart to respond. Give me the provision I need to do something about the needs that are around me because I know that they matter to you. See, we, we may not always be able to be a physical family, but we can always be a spiritual family. We can't do everything, but we all can do something. 
And I want you to understand, when we do that something, I'm not here to tell you what it is. I am not God. God knows your gifts. He knows your talents. He knows your abilities. He knows what he wants to do in your life. Okay, I'm just here to tell you, if you'll just do what God tells you to do, he'll give you all that you need, okay? I'm your, I'm your cheerleader. Those are my pom-poms. <laughs> okay, that was really... <laughs> i got to stop embarrassing myself. <laughs> L- listen, I, I, well, all I want you to know is this. Whatever God is calling you to do, you do it. And you watch how God uses you to do this. When you love others, when you do whatever God is calling you to do, whatever that is, you might think it's so small, it's so insignificant, it's not changing the world, but it will be changing the world of the person that you impact. When you love somebody who feels unloved, when you reach out to somebody who's in need, you're always going to change their world. And so dream with me. I got four minutes. Not that I care about the clock anymore, but hey. Dream, dream with me. Dream with me. You ready? What if, what if we were the church that when families came to this place, they experienced and they knew and they grew in their understanding of who God is and how much he loves them Because we, the church, were loving them and caring for them and supporting them and reaching out to their children. Not not that it's our job to raise your children. I just want you to understand that God gave those children to you. I have my own. You have your own. It's your responsibility to raise them, okay? It's our job to help you in that. I want to be very clear there, okay? But but, but I want you to understand, what, what if there were families that were totally and completely understanding who God was? Because we, the church, were showing them. We were loving for them, loving them and caring for them. W- what if? What if that teenage girl who has the untimely pregnancy, rather than running away from the church, said, you know what? There's a church tucked in a little community. It has a really hard way of getting to it. There's all these steps and there's no parking. But in that church, I know that I'm loved. And that church, I know that I'm accepted. And that church, I know that I won't be judged and I won't be condemned, but I will be cared for because that's a church that loves me. What what if? What what if? (laughs) What if we had to put together a waiting list for the nursery and the preschool volunteers people dying to get in waiting for an opportunity because we caught the passion that children are available and children need to know the love of Jesus and we as adults have an opportunity to invest in their lives what if in fact just for your parents this is just a special one you can kind of tuck this away I'm learning one of the greatest lessons I've learned in being a father is that more is caught than taught. We we can do a lot of preaching. We can do a lot of teaching. But they're actually watching our lives. Just saying. What, What if? What if instead of 400,000 orphans in our world today waiting for families to open up their homes? What if? There were families waiting for kids to be in need because the church rose up and we didn't just go to church and we didn't just call ourselves the church, but we were the church. I think personally, those what ifs could become realities when we align ourselves with the heart of God, when we seek his face and we say, God, I may not have it all together. I may not have all the answers. You know how I say it. We're, we're, we're truthfully just a bunch of imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. I don't have all the abilities, but I'm available. And I'll say yes to whatever level, at whatever capacity, 
at whatever point you want me to say yes, I'll be, I'll, I'll be available. I'll say yes. And you can use my life to make a difference in the life of somebody else. God's plan A has always been the church. God cares for all people. All lives matter to him. And he's calling us to care as well. In fact, let me just kind of set an atmosphere in your heart. I jotted these down. Just some extra add-on. Here's the deal. This is the reality. There are broken hearts in our world that need to be bind, bound. Excuse me. There are hurting families to heal. There are needy families to rescue. There are fatherless families to protect. There are weak families to defend. And we can't just sit here, as my friend Pastor Stephen Furtick says, we're not waiting on a move of God. We are the move of God. Understand your purpose. Understand your calling. Understand the plan that God has for you. You are the move of God that God wants to use to move in someone else's life for his glory and for his honor and by his power. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you that it is living and it is active and it is powerful and it does shape and form and mold our lives. And Lord, we, we recognize today that you care and that you're calling all of us to care as well. And so, Father, we, we submit to you. We, we want to be your people who say we don't have it all together, God. We might be imperfect. We might be flawed, but we're available. And so, God, we, we, we make ourselves available. Right now, God, I pray that you would stir our hearts. Even right now, God, I pray that you would give us a passion for those who are lonely, those who are familyless, those who, who are in need, God. And, and not just a passion to say, oh, I recognize them, but a passion to do whatever we can do, whatever part that might be, at whatever level, Lord, that we would be your hands and your feet extended, that we would bridge the gap, that we would build the relationship, that ultimately, God, you would use us to lead them to the gospel, the life-changing message and hope of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you give us ears to hear, a heart to receive, and that readiness to respond to where and how your Spirit leads us today. Still praying for just one moment. Maybe some of you, if you were to take inventory of your life, you might identify more with this message of being like, I, I feel like the spiritual orphan right now. I've, I've never come to the realization or I've never recognized that there's a God that loved me. I, I, I've never received his grace and his mercy in my life. I, I feel separated from God and, and I want to be part of his family. I want to know his love. I want to experience his grace. I, I, I want to be made new. I got good news for you. There is nothing that you can do to get that. There, there's nothing you can do to earn it. All you do is receive it. The Bible says that anyone that places their faith in Jesus Christ, anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you confess your need of him, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just and he will forgive you of your sins. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God's deepest desire, he delights in adopting you into his family. And he's already done all the work necessary. All you simply have to do is believe and receive. And when you do that, the Bible says God erases your past, your sins, your failures, your mistakes. They're gone. They're over. They're eradicated. He clothes you in the righteousness of Christ, meaning that when he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees what Jesus has done for you. And he gives you a fresh start. He gives you a new life. Maybe that's your prayer today. I, I want to know that forgiveness. I want to know that hope. I I want to know that relationship with God. I want to know that I am part of the family of God, that I've been adopted in, that I'm a child of the living God. I'm going to pray with you. Would you slip up your hand if you say that's me? Anyone here? See this hand back here? Anyone else? These hands over here. Could we, just, could we just pray collectively together? Would you just lift your voice, everyone in this place? Could we say, Lord Jesus, we recognize our need of you. We confess you as Savior. We confess to you our sins. 
We thank you for dying for us. We ask that you would be the Lord of our lives and that you would help us to live for you. If you prayed that simple prayer, the Bible says this, you are totally forgiven. It's gone. Don't you dare walk out of this place guilty or condemned because you are not guilty. You are not condemned. Romans says, anyone that is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Condemnation does not exist in your life. You are free from that burden. You go in the victory and the freedom that God has made available to you. And I want to tell you, you need to tell someone. Don't keep this to yourself. Tell someone. Because one of the greatest joys you will have now is to let the world know that the hope that you found, they can have as well. Can we just give praise for what God has done in his house today? As all of heaven right now is celebrating... That one who is lost is found. That one who is dead is alive. That one who is in darkness has found life. Come on. Come on. Praise him like you mean it. Let's go.